Godliness. I'm your host, Michael Potomopoulos, here with a brand new guest. So thank you so much, Jonah, for coming on today. Of course. Yeah, thanks for having me. A joy to be here. Yeah, that's great. So um, I... Uh, we had a bit of a back and forth. Well, it was a really small one, but I think it touched on one of the really cu uh, crucial and uh, interesting uh, topics that we um, Protestants have uh, tried to to uh, make a, a big deal to <laughs> to be certain. But I also do think uh, that it is something worthwhile making a big deal of because the question of justification itself is, at least uh, the way I view it, the if not the very center and end all of the faith, then at least it is the gate, it is the it is the opening, and it's the only lens through which scripture and the whole revelation of God can can be made um, meaningful to us. Um, and um, I think that um, we um, since we had a, a short um, back and forth on Twitter, I, I think it would be uh, worthwhile maybe to add. A bit of context so let's see if i can share it here right all right so um on twitter we um we talked about um the 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 tension maybe is is one way to phrase it between faith and love it, because I, I came across this post of yours um where i read that quote the difference between justifying faith and a dead faith is the virtue of love apart from love we can do nothing Thus, love forms faith and makes it a living virtue. More precisely, love can be seen as the very breath of God that causes all things to come alive. And well, um, just before we delve more into it, I, I think it might be um, beneficial if you wanted to to add some some context. Like, um, is there some um, some um, was there something going uh, going uh, before you posting this? Uh, uh, tweet or was there some some thoughts that you have been um, uh, thinking about meditating uh, on uh, before you made this post yeah that, that's a good question um one of the things that i've become increasingly more concerned about uh when talking about salvation while talking about relationship with god is really emphasizing this idea of union with christ and and emphasizing that it is a real union with christ it's not some sort of um just nice thought but there's an actual ontological reality and a component to our union with christ and so because of that i want to i want to make sure that when we talk about things like justification sanctification glorification pretty much the whole ordo salutis that we're talking about it in a way that doesn't disconnect the life of christ with our person um I think sometimes, and this is not in all cases, but I think sometimes we can talk so much about things like justification in this kind of legal sense that it seems almost as though the righteousness that is imputed to us, there's a disconnect between us and Christ, as though Christ is kind of blowing over his righteousness across a courtroom to us, and we just get this kind of waft of it around us, and then, okay, now we're, now we're declared righteous. And the emphasis of love in that, for me, is this idea that, no, it's actually Christ's righteousness being imputed to us actually does something to infuse love, faith, hope, all of these virtues. They become part of us because they are part of Christ. And all that belongs to Christ actually becomes ours. It's actually given to us in a way that actually does create an ontological change, an ontological reality within us, where we go from dead to alive, um, where we go from sinful to righteous. Um, so I want to emphasize that it's not simply a legal reality. It's real. And I think love for me, it's that underlying reality. What makes the faith that is counted to us as righteous a living faith versus a dead faith? And I would say it's love. And what is love? Well, love is Christ. Love is Christ himself taking up his abode within us. And that is how we receive his righteousness, is him taking his abode in us. And so that's where the idea of union comes in. And maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I, I will just say I like to talk about the formal cause of justification, more so emphasizing union with Christ than imputation. Because I think union with Christ 
helps us to recognize that we can we can talk about different aspects of union. There's justification, there's sanctification, and we can distinguish those things to a, to an extent. But the union is the common uh, the common denominator that threads all of those realities together and keeps them as a united outworking of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So that was kind of the thinking behind the post is just really trying to emphasize that when God declares something over us, it's not it's not simply a declaration. It actually it actually changes who we are because Christ actually does take up his abode in us through union, uh, a mutual indwelling, if you will. Yes, okay, that's nice. There's um there's a lot of good things there, most of which I would wholeheartedly agree with. Um and the reason why then um I think it's always just really helpful to to know like what's the context, what are some of the thoughts going through one's head when you uh, when somebody posts anything really, because that that really helps to frame the way we should read what we say to each other. And and uh, I mean, I I like Twitter. I think it's a nice format for for many things. But one thing it's really not good at is uh, is more is more engaging conversations with one another yeah. really lends itself towards polemics, which is also, I think, a, a fine and important discipline, but it, it should just really be a discipline held in check by also more more thorough conversations and more thorough studies. Well, that, that said, and thank you so much, Jonah, for, for adding that context to it. Um, I, I, I suppose that... Um, what, oops. Um, let's see if we can can't we both be here? No. Let's see. Oh, nice. This way. <laughs> there we go. Right. Yes. So, um, um, I, I, I commented on, on this thread because, um, as a Lutheran, of course, uh, we, we, we also uh, want to place a heavy emphasis on the doctrine of justification. And I believe that, um, because our tradition really grew out of a controversy regarding the uh, interpretation of the doctrine of justification, we might uh, too much, <laughs> some people uh, could uh, be susceptible to thinking, uh, seek to guard this doctrine against uh, possible misunderstandings. I'm, I, I'm not saying that that there's an issue here necessarily, but but when you write, as you do, that, that justifying faith the difference between justifying faith and the death faith is uh, is the virtue of love, and that apart from love we can do nothing. And then you, from these, like which are obviously true statements because they are verbatim from Scripture, right? So, so we right. of course we all need to affirm those. But when you then from these statements draw the conclusion that thus love forms faith and makes it a living virtue, I do think that. Some people could read that and, and come to some very wrong conclusions. So, I replied to to the to the tweet with the following uh, comment. Oh, and regarding comments, the, the, so we are having this conversation live. So, if some of you guys in the chat wants to add, ask questions, uh, if if you want to. Uh, have us respond uh, to to some of your considerations then feel free to share them with the chat and uh, we might um, uh, answer those questions both of us when the uh, conversation here is done so yeah so i replied to your tweet uh, by saying that faith justifies not due to any intrinsic virtue of its own like love but because it grasps jesus as its object and makes him present and where Christ is, there's righteousness and eternal life. And from what you just said, uh, you you wholeheartedly agreed, and I also yes. uh, added your comment that you replied to this and, and, and said you agreed with it. So what I think, uh, and this was the reasons why I, I thought it might be fruitful for us to have a conversation here, because um, I, um, and I may be wrong, right, but I have difficulties seeing how these two different viewpoints can be compatible. Because if you, on the one hand, um, if we, on the one hand, wants to say that faith justifies us before God because it grasps Christ and gains Him and its righteousness, then I find it difficult 
to in the same view that is with view towards the question of our justification before God. If we are having that framing of, of the relationship of, of faith and love, then I find it difficult to see how we want to say that a justifying faith is one that is formed by love and a, a virtuous thing, because then I think we begin to endanger the scriptural notion, notions of justification as something free by grace and something apart from works, because uh, as we both needless to say, no, um, love is is um, is how we obey the law i mean the whole law is fulfilled by love as, as christ says and, and the two greatest commandments is the love of god and the love of neighbor so so i think that we might be um be um, making ourselves uh, quite vulnerable to certain misunderstandings when we begin to to mix up love virtues in the article of justification when we see a clear scriptural witness of it being free by grace apart from works so so is that and do you think that's an unfair or maybe maybe i'm reading too much into your statement or, or how would you respond to that i mean i think i think we we would probably want to define some of the terms that we're using in order to see if there's an actual difference there or if it's just a misunderstanding of terms because really when i think about love when i think about faith for even uh, like regardless of what virtue we're talking about i think of it as being an extension of christ himself so its origin is supernatural i would look to like romans uh romans chapter 4 verse 1 where it says what then shall we say was gained by abraham our forefather according to the flesh right so the idea according to the flesh, it's like, okay, there are lots of things that Abraham can do according to the flesh. He can externally obey laws. He can externally uh, be circumcised. Like all of these things a person is able to do within their own natural capacity. But the one thing that they cannot do is they cannot have a love for God and a faith in God that justifies apart from God actually providing them the supernatural virtue of faith and love and hope. And so my argument would basically be that love, you could you could basically rewrite my entire tweet by saying that Christ forms faith. Because <laughs> really when I think about love, I'm thinking about Christ. Christ is the one who forms our faith. Christ is the source of our faith. And those two things are present within us and justify because Christ is the one who establishes them. So that's really how I'm approaching it. But I would, I would, I would be curious to to ask and just get your perspective, because the way that I'm thinking is trying to make sense too of like James chapter two, a dead faith versus a living faith. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the difference between a dead faith and the living faith, if not love? Right. Yes. Yes. So that's a really, really good question. Um, um, the long answer would be a, 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 a Twitter thread I wrote about the, the issue some months ago. But to sum up the answer here, it would be that when we carefully read James chapter 2, we see that he uses the term faith in a, in a different sense than uh, the Apostle Paul most often uses the term faith. So, for example, he talks about the demon demons believing that is pistis having faith, but they they shut and fear. So so the difference here between the faith or pistis of the demons, and let's say the justifying faith of Abraham, who we read hoped against hope, is trust. That would be trust. So the way I see it is that faith is by its very um, um, very being and very substance, something that receives or grasps onto things. It, it would be meaningless, in other words, to talk about a faith that does not receive something from the outside. It might be a promise. It might be a character. It might be an act or an idea. But faith grasps onto that which it receives from the outside. So it's something where we are the passive agent receiving something externally. So. On the other hand, I think love is something that comes out from the subject. So, for example, when when love when we love something, it's because we have a certain benevolence or a, a, a certain uh, humility or, or, or willing of self-sacrifice towards a thing. Like when we love something, we want to give ourselves to it. We want to, to serve, to help, um, 
and to um to sacrifice i mean i think love is really self-giving in a certain sense but it's it's yeah. hard for me to, to just boil it down one to one but you see all these definitions of love is something that comes or springs from me and goes out of me to somebody else and i think this is the danger we we have when we when we too um too callous might be too strong of a word but if we are not if we are not on god we might intermix the love that we give with faith that receives from from christ so of course i would like to say that having been justified walking in faith hoping against hope in these wonderful promises this faith will will express itself towards love but but then again the love are the fruits that are uh, uh, being brought forth by the the living tree so they are both temporally but also causally posterior to to the justifying faith and it, it's in this sense that i think that we, we we must distinguish love from faith because faith receives christ it receives the promises of christ and makes him present there and then i think we we wholeheartedly agree uh, about uh, about having been united to christ through faith and baptism he is present within us. He is present around us. We are united to him and receives, receive from him forgiveness of sins, eternal life, grace, blessings, and and um, and and strength. Um, so, but this is all the receptive part. We don't really bring anything to the table, so to say, at least not with regard to Christ. Um, and I, I think that viewing viewing love at, as the aggressive, like going outward, going out of oneself uh an active part then it's more probably viewed as a responsive act, uh, aspect to uh, a justification having been received passively by faith hmm. okay Th this is probably a good place to to park for a little bit and, and talk because i think there might be some disagreement here because i i would argue that like okay you you take the 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 pistis of the demons versus the pistis that justifies and the demons believe in shudder and and your argument is that the difference there is this idea of trust but my, my argument would be that trust flows from love you cannot trust something without loving that thing um i i would argue that if you if you take almost every example of something that goes from a mere belief to an actual trust the difference between that mere belief and that trust is love love then fills the gap between those two things because there are things i believe in i believe in the demons for example but i certainly don't love the demons i don't trust in demons but i believe in them yes. and the difference between my belief in a demon and my belief in god to me it is not is not the intellectual assent to both of these realities it's the actual love the direction of my heart um and and i think i think the difference too is i would not see love as simply because it's something that goes out from us as actually being qualitatively a work that is somehow accomplished from me as though I am the source. Because I would argue that faith, hope, and love as theological virtues are things that are given by God and gifted by God. And so my argument would be that the faith which forms my faith, enabling me to trust in Christ and to take hold of him, none of that originates from me, not even the love. The love itself is a gift of God, and therefore, I would argue, does not step into the territory of me doing something towards God from my own capacity, my own works, or my own efforts, because I would want to maintain very clearly that faith alone justifies. But I would say the faith, the quality of that faith is one formed by love, which is also a gift of God. So. Okay, yeah, well, that, that's good because I think we are, we are narrowing in here the uh, what might be a disagreement. So when the object of hope is something personal like God, then I also think um, in the concrete, it will be very difficult to differentiate faith from trust, from love, because these in the personal <clears throat> relationship when for example when when we hope and cling to god it, it's really difficult to to to, to um, divide uh, our trust in god from from our love in god but i mean most of the time i would say we are not trusting god but we're trusting god's promises and it's certainly 
very easy for me to comprehend how uh, we trust certain promises. Also, we don't really think there's a theoretical possibility like Christ died for sinners, but or that Christ um, atoned for the sins of the world. But we trust those promises to be true and valid for me. It's true and valid for me. And that's what differentiates us for the demons. Because the demons know that Christ is Lord. The demons know that Christ atoned for the sins of the world, but they do not trust in that. And we sinners, we, I think, for to be justified, we we must trust in them and, and, and believe them to be certain and true promises. And here I think it, it's, it, it should, I, I suppose, be more easy to understand how we can't really say that we we love in these promises or it is our love towards uh, the promises of gra uh, Christ grasped by faith that that adds some 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 virtuous consideration to to justifying faith hmm. yeah I, I don't I don't know if I agree I just I, to me it's it's difficult to it's difficult for me to make the make the jump from the belief of a demon to a faith that justifies without seeing the difference being a faith formed by love. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, it, it just seems to me that like, again, I feel like I'm being redundant here, so forgive me. But when I think about those things in my life that I trust versus those things in my life that I believe, the difference is that trust flows from a place of love um because to trust something to me is like i heard an analogy a long time ago by an evangelical pastor um but he had a, he had a chair that he set up on the stage and he said you know there's the difference between a living faith and a dead faith is i could say i believe that chair will support my weight but until i actually sit in the chair I'm not actually trusting in the chair, right? I can believe that the chair will support my weight, but until I sit in the chair, I won't actually be able to test that. And to me, the, the analogy, it, it fails to a certain extent because obviously then it has us having to perform an action, which I would disagree with being a part of, of justification. But I do think it gets to the heart that trust is something that you do out of a place of like a full knowledge of something and an actual, yes, I, I believe this and I, I, I want to move towards this. And I don't see how that kind of a posture of heart can take place without love, without, without Christ himself taking up residence within us and, and moving our hearts in that direction towards him. Um, like St. Paul, when he talks about love in, in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, I know it's not in context a passage about justification, but he says, if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And yeah. so I look at that and he's he's not talking about a dead faith there. He's talking about a faith that can move mountains. And yet he's saying without love, it's nothing. And so to me, <laughs> I don't want to say that the faith that justifies is nothing, and so I feel like I have to include love as a as a for, formational piece of of that faith in order for that faith to then move and 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 live and breathe and go towards Christ and take hold of the promises of Christ and yeah c come into this union with Christ uh, and I, I I don't intellectually see a way around this. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, interesting. So I I think. There is a certain agreement about the result, but we are having some uh, some some disagreements about the oh, what's the English term for that? You know, when you have a mathematical uh, equation you need to solve, and you have the result, and then you have like the calculation itself. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah, certain I don't, I, term for that. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, okay. I think there is. My wife's good at math. I'm not, <laughs> so she would know. <laughs> in, in Danish, it's called uh, mellemregning, and that means like uh, the middle of the. Uh, calculation, which is a really pedagogical term, I, I suppose. So I think we have some some disagreements here about the the machinery and, and working here. So um, while you 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 shared your analogy, I, I tried to think of an uh, imp. Uh, of course, most analogies have some failings and and suffer from imperfections at least at some point. But I, I, I tried to see if I could come up with one demonstrating the way I I I am um, understand the issues here at play. So so I think. The way I would frame it would be that 
if you had been in a mortal accident, right, and you have been shot, driven over, and you were picked up by an ambulance and you're just about to die, and this doctor runs into the ambulance and, and says to you, I will save you. I, I will save you. It's going to be a very risky operation, but I, I, can, I can save you. If you trust me, you can give your consent to this procedure, and, 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 and I promise you I'll save you. I mean, if you grasp <laughs> grasp that promise by faith and say yes, and 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 let's see, by by an intervention of a God, this is a most wonderful, miraculous doctor who will save a hundred out of a hundred patients. Then I do think there we have a sort of an imperfect analogy of of what I mean by by trusting the promises of God without then. Uh, without then love adding something substantially necessary to the equation because having been healed waking up from the procedure love would be the most natural uh product of, of, of such a wonderful turn of events right it, it would be the the the, the true and, and genuine expression of any virtuous individual but but in that situation itself i, I think we can we can at least mentally uh, from my point of view, differentiate between love and then trust. Yeah, that, that's 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 fair, and that, that is a good and helpful analogy. Um, and and I, I do see your point, but I, I still feel as though I still feel as though love plays a role in in even that kind of an analogy because we would have to ask the question: What would compel somebody to trust a doctor who they do not know? who's promising to save them, what would compel somebody to say, okay, well, perhaps it's a love for human life and they want to preserve their life and they love that and they don't want to lose that. But to me, there still seems to be an element of a love for something that has to come out in order for that trust to then manifest. You have to actually have a reason to live. If you don't have a reason to live, you would say, yeah, no, just throw in the towel, doc. I'm, I'm okay dying. You know, I don't, I don't want to be saved. And so to me, like, the underlying desire there is there's a desire for life. And why is there a desire for life? Well, because there's a love for life. There's something about life that the person loves, right? And so even, even in something like that, and I know I'm not trying to take the analogy too far. I apologize if I am. No, it's, it's fine. But, it's fine. but I, I still feel like there's, there's an element of love implicit within trust, even if the object of, of the love is directed away from the object of trust. Love is still something that formulates and informs what to trust, what to move forward for. And it's what separates a dead, empty belief of the demons and a faith that actually justifies. Um, maybe if I, you can, you can direct me to a different line of thinking if you'd like to, but I think what might help progress the conversation a little bit is if you and I just gave a brief, just what do we think justification is? Like, mm -hmm. what is its end? What does it tell us? What, are, what does it do? Because maybe if we kind of bring our views very specifically, we can kind of see maybe if there's a little bit more to this than what we're, we're just narrowly focusing on now. Yeah, so, so just before we do that, I, I think um, here just just to to make you give you a, a chance to elaborate a bit on this because I, I think uh, I think we might be talking a bit past each other here because now I think at least I understood the, the tweet from the beginning uh, where you where you mentioned love to to be talking specifically about us loving God or loving nature while here when we discussed the analogy just before it seemed like now we talked about like of course you need to, to have a certain, let's say, sense of self-preservation. I mean, to to want to be to be safe, and and of course, I mean, uh, you it, it wouldn't really be meaningful to talk about uh, accepting uh, Christ's forgiveness unless you wanted to be forgiven. So, I mean, of course, but th that's not. I mean, I, I think I think it's fair to say that is not what the disagreement is about. Like, uh, it would be about is is the is love of God, for example, necessary for a justifying faith, right? Uh, to to a certain extent, though, I would say, like, if if somebody desires forgiveness, where does that desire come from? How how is that posture of heart actually present in the person, which then compels them towards faith? 
because I do think that actually is is kind of touching on the point that I'm trying to make because I, I think we would both agree if somebody has faith, they are they are directionally towards God and reaching out with faith to take hold of the promises of God. Um, and so if, if that if that posture of heart takes place in a person where before they were in a place of rebellion towards God, animosity towards God, wanted nothing to do with God, were running from God, dead in their sins. What is the what is the change of heart that causes one to go from dead in sins, running from God, an enemy of God, to moving in the direction now of I want forgiveness and I want to receive the grace of the Lord? Yes. What what happens there? What is that change in heart? Okay, that's good. Well, then, then I think we should um, uh, we should pick up your proposition that let's let's then maybe try and and present how we understand uh, justification more uh, more in line of, of the of the things that that happens. The, the let's say the movement from uh, on justified enemy of of god under his just condemnation to an adopted son uh, of the lord so so if, if you would like to 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 try and expand that present that for us um then then i will uh, i'll try to give you my view afterward sure yeah so so the way that i view justification is is very simply justification is the eschatological declaration of righteousness pronounced to the people of God, and really I should say justification is the eschatological declaration pronounced upon Christ that is shared in by those who are united to Christ. And so those who are united to Christ in faith become partakers of this justification, which then by the work of the Spirit throughout their lives, they become conformed to that declaration. So at last on judgment day, when they stand before the throne of God, the declaration of righteous given to them in the present will match who they have become in Christ Jesus conformed to his image on that day. So do you believe in purgatory? I would believe in, in a, a post death cleansing, a post death sanctification, okay. but I, I would, I would reject the idea of, of a purgation of, of temporal debt of sin and stuff. Okay, like yes, that. yes, 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 because if, if the, if the bar, because I mean, I, I think almost all historic Protestants do believe, of course, in, in some sort of post mortem purification. But it was just, uh, I just wanted, I was just curious since you used that phrase that when at the, is that the particular judgment or is that at the last judgment that we will have been transformed perfectly? Yeah, glor I, maybe I'll just say at glorification, upon glorification. The declaration of righteous that oh, we receive yeah. in the present will be fully realized by the work of the Spirit and sanctification. Yeah. Well, I, well, I would agree with that. Yeah. So, I would agree with yeah. That. so uh, I think one of the one of the unspoken agreements <laughs> between us is also that we both view uh, faith, love, all the supernatural virtues, indeed, as gifts from God. Right. So I, yes. I think I could hear that between the lines of what you said, and it, I'm just making it explicit what we both um, talked about implicitly here for the benefit of the listeners because um, I'm not trying to Im impute any sort of like syllogism or, or something to your position right so so it is they are indeed gifts of, of, of God so the way I would frame justification is that when the since God's salvific desire is to save all men then he has instituted in this fallen and miserable world of ours um, uh, means by which he calls people to himself. These means are, they are different. But normally he works through the preaching uh, of the spoken word because uh, God himself has chosen to unite the workings of his Holy Spirit to, to the word of God. We see this most clearly in the Holy Sacraments where there is a, um, a, a most yeah, most wonderful unit, unit, union between the working of God and uh, the spoken word. But we also see it more generally in preaching. Um, and when God, through the spoken word, moves and calls people to himself, he works uh, on, the, on, on, on people to work repentance in them, to work godly sorrow uh, for their sins. And then when these supernatural virtues 
are beginning to, to flourish within the repentant uh, believer, then by this supernatural gift, they receive supernatural faith, which is not something sinful or mortal man can, can exercise or conjure up through any means of, of his own. But he received this gift from on high and is thus enabled to receive Christ, who is, as we see in the sacraments as well, present in the world. And when he is grasped and received uh, by supernatural faith, which we have received from God, then we are justified because by faith Christ is made present. We are united to him. We are adopted as sons. We are regenerated. That is born anew spiritually. And um, and and that means that there's no longer any condemnation. There's no longer uh, any divine wrath for our sins because when we have when we are united to Christ, our sins are obliterated, destroyed, and removed because they cannot stand in the presence of Christ. And on the other hand, we also receive His perfect righteousness. So it's not only like the negative. This is why I'm also very comfortable about talking about imputation because I think. Um, not to the detriment of union with God, as we just uh, talked about, and which we are very wholeheartedly in agreement about, but because I think the term imputation is quite helpful in in underlining um, uh, the priority, right? So when we are imputed with something, we are the little guy. We are receiving something greater, something larger. Um, and, and I think that's a good way to view it because when we are united to Christ, we don't really bring a lot to the table. But our by our spiritual husband, right? He has everything. He is the, the he is the he is the glorious king and emperor. He's he's the rich prince saving this miserable, dirty girl in the ditch, right? Which was which was me, which was you, and yeah. um, and that's why I think that. Just like a covering embrace, imputation is, is kind of this receptive, all-encompassing gift, which of, which cannot be uh, divided from from union, because that's from where it flows. That is the foundation or the ontological reality enabling imputation to take place. But um, but I think it's just it's it's a good way about speaking it and conceptually understanding it. But but this faith, supernatural faith, receiving the prom the spoken promises of God, the reasons why I think we can exclude love from this specific understanding of the reception of divine forgiveness, and that is within the within the article of justification specifically is because as I tried to share with the analogy of, let's say the doctor saving you on, on your deathbed is because why do you trust this doctor? Well, maybe there's no reason. I would say the reason why anybody would trust the, the divine promises given uh, by uh, given by scripture is because they received this gift from on high to receive that by trust and love only comes in posteriorly to that because love itself is a divine virtue is a sort of a human response to, to to these glorious gifts sure so so maybe so if we both agree that that the the theological virtues of faith hope and love are ultimately gifts from god that he gives to us what would be the primary significance in your mind to not including love as saying forming faith if the gift is from god in the first place then why why would there still be because I, I get the sense there's still a concern in you that if we if we go there we are somehow slowly bringing ourselves into an active role in our justification when it should be a passive one and i i would i would just push back and say if you agree that love after faith comes from god is sourced from god which i would agree with yes. then what difference does it make in terms of where it's placed if it's a gift anyways okay yeah that's good that's good so i, I think we need to be careful because um we can also um we can view these ver uh, virtues and that is both love hope and faith we can view them uh, at least under two different aspects so for example um Faith justifies because it, it grasps Christ, right? Um, and some people have a very strong faith. Some people are like Abraham, who could like believe 
against hope and who could willingly sacrifice his own son on account of the word of God. I mean, you are father, right? Uh, I am not yet. Okay, well, well, it's just, but but I mean, for all the fathers, uh, we we have four yeah. children. Um, oh wow! And um, and I just think that the, the absolute horror of imagining yourself being in that position, torn between your child and and God's word, is is unimaginable for for most. Uh, I I think, um, but Abraham had such a strong faith <laughs> that he that he could. And uh, what yeah. I'm trying to say is that. In some faith is is stronger, and in some it's weaker. But we would, I think, we would both say that it, it justifies, regardless of whether faith is is is, is a strong, burning fire like Saint Augustine, or if it's um, like like the poor <clears throat> centurion who, who 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 yelled to Christ, uh, I believe, held my disbelief. I mean, he was uh, he believed, and his daughter was healed, right? <laughs> And yeah. there was also the centurion who, who said to Christ, like, well, I'm a commander. You can just order this to happen just as I order my soldiers around and it will happen. I mean, he mm -hmm. had a really strong faith and it also happened. So so in the same way, we can see uh, these uh, supernatural virtues as kind of habitual virtues. That is to say, we can. Some people have a much more fervent love of God and neighbor than others, and some have a much more fervent love of God than others, and sorry, a more a stronger faith of God than others. Then I would say the reasons why um, we can't just say like, well, love and faith and hope are gifts of God, so it shouldn't really be a problem to to co-join them within the article of justification, is because. People then, and I, I think this is the case with many Roman Catholics, begin to think that, well, yes, of course, supernatural love is a gift from God, but I can increase this habitual virtue by good works, by devotions, and if that further justifies me before God, then I also need to say and conclude that I'm further justified by having received this gift from God, right, but by cultivating and increasing it through my obedience through my works, and so on. And then I think we do come into, into works righteousness because then we mix the law with the gospel because the law says, if you want to be justified, obey my commandments. And the commandments are love God, love your neighbor. And if you want to be, be just and justified still by obeying these, then, then you're no longer following the gospel that said like what the law could not do because of the weakness of the flesh, God did. And I, I think this is where it becomes very dangerous. Um, sure. Yeah, that that might bring out another area of disagreement because I'm not I'm not entirely convinced. I mean, and this is part of why I'm an Anglican and not a Lutheran, but I'm not entirely convinced of all the features of the law and gospel distinction that you'd find in Lutheranism. Now, granted, I'll just say I'm I, I need to do a lot more reading on this subject before I, I speak very definitively. I haven't I haven't actually read a whole lot. Um, but from what I have read, my concern is that it ends up not recognizing the reality of grace at the root of all good works that come after justification. And I don't want to make the case, to be very clear, I don't believe that justification is a qualitative uh, growing type type thing. I, I would I would agree that it's a declaration of of righteous given to us on account of Christ's merits alone. But what I would want to say is that that declaration of righteous is then made manifest in our lives as we are sanctified. It's not that it increases, but it's made manifest in our lives. So qualitatively, it does not change. The person who is justified at the very beginning of the Christian life is just as righteous as the one who has undergone 25 plus years of sanctification. They both possess the same exact righteous status before the Lord. But there is a difference in terms of how that actually is made manifest in their life, how it shows up, and therefore their ability to actually enter into participation more fully. I would say that there's a difference between a saint who is in heaven and glorified right now, and me, who is still struggling with the flesh. And it's not simply this mortal body. It's an actual qualitative difference in the sense that somebody in heaven who has been glorified 
who has been removed from their sin is now in a state of enjoyment of Christ without the hindrance of many of the things that I still have hindering me here living in a fallen world. We're both righteous. According to, according to God, I am, I am righteous and I, I possess that just as they do. But the qualitative experience of that reality is different. And so I, I, I would just want to emphasize that the works that we do after justification do indeed actually transform us and bring us into a greater conformity with Christ that actually does bring the experience of that declaration into a greater fruition. And perhaps I'm just mincing words here, um, but I, I would want to maintain that if we believe that the works that we do after faith are really totally disconnected from that declaration, I do think we run the risk of undermining the fact that those works are a product of grace in the Christian life. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, no, it, 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 it's good. It's good. I am. I'm just trying to think what of it I, I wanted to. Do. So uh, but apart from a very few comments, I, I, I would agree with all of that, all of what you just said. And I would want to reiterate or at least really emphasize that when Lutherans divide law and gospel, it is with an eye toward the article of justification. Because as you said, St. Augustine was not more justified before God than, let's say, Emperor Constantine, who was uh, baptized on his deathbed, though he was by no means a great and glorious saint, at least not in the League of St. Augustine. And and both, yet both were uh, equally justified before God because they were both united to Christ. And, yeah. and, and, and it is here that I want to say that it is so necessary to divide law from gospel because when, when our consciousness is stricken, when we again and again fall for different habitual sins, when we don't really, when, when for example, when we read scripture, when we study, when we have a good intensive period of, of spiritual fruition in our lives quite often it can lead to a much deeper understanding of our own sinfulness um and then we can really struggle and i think in this struggle we really need to divide law from gospel because the law sets forth the perfect demands of, of god's uh, holy will and and the gospel sets forth his free uh, unconditional promises and, and 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 when we're stricken by by sin and, and and sorrow then we need the the gospel and not the law but and this is where i think we really agree when we're not talking about justification before god then works do really not only change us ontologically i mean we grow in sanctity we grow in holiness we conform ourselves more and more to the image of christ by putting to death the body of sin uh, by uh, obedience to to God's law. So the law is not just a, a mirror to tell us this is where you're all wrong, but it's also a pathway to make us grow in virtue and holiness. And I think I can't remember the exact translation into English, but but there, uh, there's a passage where it says, um, uh, "Confirm or strengthen your faith by works." Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and and Lutherans have continually said that using the distinction between, let's say, faith as a habitual virtue, stronger in some than in others, then, I mean, by, um, let's say, daily prayer and devotion, by meditation on the Word of God, we do strengthen our faith, we do grow in a relationship to, to Christ, and we make it much harder for ourselves to, to fall into mortal sin, for example, to fall into a situation where we have sinned so much that we despair and we do not um, and we do not um, uh, repent of our sins anymore. And it is in this manner that works really do change us, really do transform us, and, and do something very important in our lives. Um, would you would you connect works at all to justification um, in terms of like they are the outgrowth of the declaration? Would you would you agree with that? 
Yeah, so the way we have traditionally phrased it is that we talk about a justification before God and a justification before men. So, for example, um, so when we are justified before God, then it, that is by faith alone, apart from works. But we can't read the hearts of other Christians. So the way that justifying faith expresses itself and makes itself visible and real in the world, in the Christian community, towards the brothers in the faith, that is through exterior works. Um, and that's why we are supposed to judge a tree according to its, fru its fruits. That's why I think uh, St. James' epistle is, is so useful and, and good, because it really talks about these people who claim claim to have faith, but have no works. So that's why it's, it's so important. Yeah, so so that that actually is very very helpful for me because it kind of gets back to, I think my point that I'm trying to make about love, um, if if faith is meant to manifest in good works, and in a sense we're justified before God by faith alone, but then the justification that takes place before man is based upon the fruit that we bear. We're able to look at one another and recognize the good fruit in one another's life. And if there, that is absent, right? If, if somebody claims to have faith, but does not have any good works whatsoever, they're living a life of, of licentiousness and sin, and they, they do not follow after Christ. They do not um, uh, love their neighbor. They do not love God. If, if those things are not manifest, it demonstrates the faith to be dead, yes, right? I would and agree. So, and so the question that I would then say is, does that not <laughs> indicate that the difference between a dead faith and a living faith is the resulting love? No, no, because love will always be posterior to, to sanctifying faith, whether, whether it is there or not. So for somebody who is justified before God, they're justified justified by faith alone apart from works and also apart from love uh, but that will then afterward having been justified express itself in love so for somebody to have no love at all is not for example it's not always that that you can judge it i mean in almost all cases you can of course but i, I think it, it's it's something i think we might end up confusing uh, the the cause uh with the um, with the effect because love of god and love of neighbor is, is an effect right and if you want to in 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 impose that into justification before god then for me at least it seems like we want to make the effect uh, self cost <laughs> in some sense sure okay I, I think i see what you're saying yeah i would i would to be very clear i wouldn't say that love is part of justification it's not what is counted towards us as our justification i would i wouldn't say we're justified by love i would say we're justified by faith i would just want to say that the faith is made alive by love um and that that's that's the qualitative difference between a dead faith and a living faith not that god looks upon our faith and our love and our hope and he's factoring all these things together um but just that love is the present abiding reality of Christ that then enlivens our faith to make it justifying. Um, and I, I think, I don't think that I'm, I'm, I'm stepping out of line to say that almost all of the reformers, at least within the Anglican tradition, like in the homily of justification, um, Cranmer talks about how when we talk about faith alone justifying, we are not saying faith alone to the exclusion of love and hope. We are just saying that those things are not part of what the declaration is based upon. The declaration is based upon faith alone. Um, and I would agree with that. But he doesn't rule let, out let the presence you, of those things. So let me ask you that, that one question. If, so Cranmer's um, Book of Homilies, mm -hmm. where he talks about justification, if we say that, when we say that we are justified by faith alone, but not to the exclusion of love, we are just saying that love does not enter into the what were what's the exact wording you gave? Oh, I, I can't remember. Um, lo love is not factored into the declaration of righteous faith. Yes. Faith alone is, but that faith is abiding with hope and love, which all together are in unison with one another 
in a sense they they can they they participate in one another and i would say they form one another um but when it comes to what is what is so you have this love right and this love is forming this faith and there's hope in there and all of this and they're mixing together they're all together what is the thing that actually reaches out and grabs hold of christ it's faith alone but that faith alone does not just stand there apart from love apart from hope those things are there but that but love does not reach out and take hold of christ hope does not reach out and take hold of christ to justify faith does that is the distinct virtue that does but not to the exclusion of these realities that are also gifts of god within the believer um that's good that's good but yes okay i think we should give our closing comments and sure, then yeah. go to q a so if there are any more questions here from our viewership we up it says like 160 so that's quite good oh wow yeah that's awesome so if any of you have any questions and i'll check uh twitter as well just before we uh, we sign off uh, cool. then you're welcome to to throw them in the chat here beneath um do you want to to go first with the closing comment or would you prefer to have the last one uh i i can go first that's fine um yeah i i think i think all i would want to say is when I think about justification, the kind of going back to just my initial comments, I want to be very, very clear that what forms our faith, what forms our love, what forms everything that there is about the Christian life, what compels us and moves us forward to be a Christian is Christ Jesus himself. He is the one, he is the only one, he is the only way, the only truth, the only life, the only possible hope of us turning our eyes away from sin in repentance towards towards god and so because of that i would want to emphasize that any anything within us that reaches out to take hold of the promises of god is wrought within us by the abiding presence of jesus christ who takes up his abode within us and i would say hope love faith these are these are these are ways in which we describe christ himself they are, they are they are not distinct from Christ. So when I say that I love God, the love that drives me to love God is Christ Jesus himself who dwells within me. When I say that I have faith in God, that is the faith of Christ which dwells within me. I want I want to emphasize that union brings about these realities and and so I just don't want to separate them from the 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 full expression of the Christian life. I think one of the the struggles I have with some of the more systematic approaches to theology is we we break things down and we separate and I I get it it's systematic theology we're trying to make separations and distinctions but I think sometimes when we're like okay let's talk about justification over here and we'll talk about sanctification over here or let's talk about faith over here and love over here we begin to break down a reality that is is a very organic uh, mutual reality. And so my argument that love forms faith and brings faith to life such that it can grab on to, to Christ is, is really rooted in the idea that these are gifts of God and extensions of Christ himself to us. Um, and that, that, that's probably, um, a good, a good place to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Jonah, for that. I think we, we, we do have a lot of substantial agreements um, and also think that especially when we because we both affirm justification by faith alone i think from my perspective at least this conversation is mostly born out of a pastoral consideration because i think we can formulate our theology in a more guarded manner to help comfort and edify believers so the reason why and i'm so glad you wanted to come on this conversation but the reason why i have a kind of a knee knee jerk reaction against um imposing love as being something necessary for for justification or something that uh, vivifies or uh, forms faith in such a manner that it justifies is because i think that then we open ourselves to the question and scrupulosity about our love being imperfect. Because even though it's a gift from God, we don't love God as we should love God. 
Christ ourselves, Christ our Lord said that we should be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the great two commandments is to love God with all your heart, soul, might, power. And, and, and the case is we simply don't do that. And I'm not at all saying that's your viewpoint. And I don't even think like you could even the most extreme semi Pelagian Roman Catholic would not <laughs> would not say that either. So I'm not trying to to draw up a straw man uh, against some other uh, tradition here. But what I am really trying to say is that I do believe many sinners, many believers who struggle with habitual sins, who have suffered very painful setbacks in, in their pilgrimage here on earth, could struggle with with such a position that they see their love as insufficient they see themselves as <laughs> questioning whether they have done enough and and i think i'll just sum up my position with this uh, quotation from from johan gerhard which uh, which i've kind of used uh, also before but i just want to to read it here in its entirety namely that faith concerns itself with god's works love with our works Faith accepts the benefits of Christ. Love returns a mutual benevolence. Faith has an apprehensive power. Love an aggressive power. Faith is begging, so to speak. Love is giving. Faith creates children of God. Love shows them that they have become so. The object of faith is Christ as offered in the gospel along with all his benefits. Love's object is God and our neighbor. Furthermore, the nucleus of the gospel is not love, with both Christ and the apostles teach in clear language is the sum of the law. But rather, the nucleus of the gospel is Christ alone, the mediator, whom faith embraces and holds. And the reason why I, I, I do like this quotation is because faith is these empty hands. We don't come with so, any virtues. We don't come with any any sort of uh, effectual love or, or hope when we grasp Christ. We only come with, with a trusting desire, which is, a, which is a gift from our Lord himself. So that was a really good and interesting discussion. And we held our uh, time schedule, just one hour and two minutes. So that's, that's awesome. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, for this, it, it was really, really great, and it was really nice to talk with you and, and meet you. Um, yeah. If you have time, then I think we could go through some of the questions if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. I've got time. Oh, that's excellent. So let's see. Um, some of the comments are just comments on the stream. What a living, creative, active, powerful thing is faith. It is impossible that faith ever stop doing good. I think that's a quotation from Luther's Galatians commentary, actually. Hmm. But, uh, not really a question. Uh, this is a great and important convo that I think truly does get at the nuanced differences at the heart of the debate around justification. Um, through faith, a person will do to everyone without coercion, willingly and happily. He will serve everyone, suffer everything for the love and praise of God. Let's show him. Well, none of these are questions. Okay, here's the question. To what extent is trying to imagine faith without love uh, futile? Are we searching the unsearchable here? Well, what do you think? Uh, it, it kind of goes to your comment about systematic theology breaking yeah. things more apart then. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think this is this is actually pretty spot on. Uh, maybe some of where my my concerns stem from. Um, the quote you just read to to close, you said that was that was Gearhard. Yeah, yeah, Johan Gerhard, right? Yeah. So so I would say I agree with that whole quote. There's Ooh. nothing I disagree mm -hmm. about that quote. I would just say there's no real need to make those precise distinctions between faith and love because they are always joined together. If we, if we have faith in Christ, it will manifest in a love for God and a love for neighbors such that I don't think it's wise to say one is prior to the other or this comes first and this. I just think that's that's creating too many distinctions that I, I don't see in Scripture. I really don't see that in Scripture. To me, I, I see a much more holistic approach, which is that our faith and our love are joined together. <laughs> and enlivened by one another, so to speak. Yeah. And they simply, faith working through love, right? That's what St. Paul says. And to me, that's that's exactly that's exactly right. Faith 
works through love. Love is the fuel that moves faith forward. It is the it is the it is the reality that underlies all other realities. And so it, it's not so much uh did this happen first or did this happen first or how do we it's just recognizing faith and love will always be together in the Christian life and to try to picture faith without love or love without faith is futile in my in my mind. So that's 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 really I think yeah, that gets to the heart of kind of what I'm trying to say. Yes. And while I also wholeheartedly agree that there is no justified believer who does not have love, then I think the differentiation or the division, which I've tried, tried to draw up here to today, is important because of pastoral consideration. So I, I won't repeat what I just said before, but I, I do think it's, it's, it's true and helpful. I think it's scriptural as well, but I do really think it's important, especially in, in soul care, because when we when we talk to faith, we are talking about something that looks outside of you to something exterior. While if we talk about love, we look for something uh, internally, something that's inside of us. And I, I think that when we're struggling, then it, it, we need to look to God, um, and 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 that that's why I think that just from this pastoral consideration that there, there might be some benefits to to what this differentiation but of, of course it, it can be taken too far so i'm also sympathetic just to to some of your uh, comments sure yeah so um this is a broad question i think we should just answer it by uh, watch the video from the beginning <laughs> yeah that sounds that sounds fair <laughs> yes um, then we have an interesting question here, not entirely relevant to the to the discussion here, but I, I think we could uh, give a, our answer to it. So the question is, do you believe post-mortem sanctification uh, for only those who fall in, uh, asleep in godliness or for the wicked as well? Yeah, I would say for for those who fell asleep in godliness, those who are those who are in fellowship with Jesus Christ, those who are united to him. If you die and you are not inside Christ, you are not united to him by faith, then I do not believe that you can participate in the benefits of Christ, which would include sanctification. Sanctification is an extension of our union with Christ, and the wicked are not in Christ, and therefore they cannot participate in the benefits of Christ. Yes, and I would agree with that. I think this is a sad reality, but it is also one we, we cannot shy away from as christians because we are bound by god's revealed word and and here we just find um the reality that there is forgiveness only in christ and and that forgiveness is present only to those who receive christ in this present life there's no conversion post-mortem um yeah. so let that also be a an exhortation for us to to share this wonderful gift we have all received in christ amen yeah um, I don't think many classical purgatory believers believe in purgatory for the wicked. The, oh, I think this is a uh, comment to uh, the question we had before. Yeah. So here's a question. Could Mr. Sala explain his understanding of the auto salutus in infant baptism? Sorry, in infant baptism. I see this as the baby being given faith and then growing in love as they grow. But I want to hear his articulation. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that child is given faith and growing in love as they as they grow and develop but i would also want to emphasize the fact that the role of the church and the parents uh in in infant baptism also play a role the parents and the church are bringing their child to baptism in faith and love and that in a real sense is a is a is a partaker um in 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 the reality of the regeneration of the child um i think we can all attest that if we were raised in a christian home by good and faithful Christian parents, our faith in a real sense is an extension of our parents' faith. I, I am a Christian because my parents were Christians and they raised me in the faith. And so I have their faith, which then developed and became my own, but I would not have my faith, um, you know, unless God had a, a providential plan different. But in the case of my life, I would not have my faith apart from my parents' faith. And so I would also just want to emphasize that the faith and love of the parents for the child that brings them with the church to baptism is also factored into the regeneration that God works within the child at baptism. Yeah, that's good. I, I, well, the question was directed to you, but I would just say that 
I think here it's also very helpful to consider the difference between a reflexive faith, that is a self-conscious faith that can think about itself, that can think about, well, I believe in God. And that's the kind of faith that we adult Christians, uh, grown-up Christians exercise when we meditate or consider divine things. But um, we don't, normally <laughs> don't have that sort of faith when we go around our daily lives and are mindful of other things or when we sleep and so on. So, so f- infants do, in a very concrete sense, receive the faith uh, yeah. as a gift in baptism, uh, which is a, a wonderful mystery. But we should just not uh, draw the straw man that they have, let's say, some self-conscious articulation of let's say luther's small catechism when they're six months old so so but they have this original trust fear and 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 love of god which we would all have had had we not fallen uh, in sin yeah that's that's really good and i just i want to make one more comment i think that um it's problematic when we assume that faith is necessarily a very intellectual understanding that we then can articulate and confess. And this, this kind of understanding of faith seems to me to be more rooted in like a Baptist theology than it does actual historic uh, Catholic uh, Christian practice. Faith is a gift of God and is not always like, like uh, Michael said, a a conscious reality. Um, I'm still here. I'm just, um, my camera just decided to uh, be weird. So <laughs> no worries. It's good that we're almost done here. Uh, the very last question, and, and then we'll uh, then I'll let you all go, all go. Um, so here, um, maybe I missed this, but how does one go about reconciling James 2 uh, 24 and Romans 3 28? We did touch on this uh, should we refer back to that or should we just uh, rehash it here again um yeah you could you if you want to give your comments first and then i can uh we could just briefly summarize yes okay so uh, i i would just like to say here that um that saint james epistle concerns the question of those who claim to have faith but do not have works so th- so the context here is specifically about those who make this um, assertion about themselves. And then how we are to judge this assertion is that the believer's um, claim of justifying faith is either vindicated or um, or proven false by its outworking in love, that is, in good works. Because as some of the, at least the Greek reading uh, listeners and viewers here would know the Greek term uh, dikaio, can mean either to justify as opposed to to condemn but it can also mean demonstrate or, or vindicate so for example we read that christ himself was was vindicated we read that uh, the 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 group of uh, the 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 mass of the Judeans, they they vindicated god i mean it would be blasphemous for us to say that they <laughs> justified god and Christ, our Lord, says that wisdom is vindicated by her children and, and so on. So I would say that um, faith working in love is the visible demonstration of vindication of this invisible reality which faith is because we cannot look into the hearts of believers. Yeah, I would agree with much of that. I would want to. I would just want to emphasize that I think the difference, and this is kind of the crux of the whole conversation, the difference between a living faith and a dead faith is that love forms it um the the difference between people who claim to have faith but do not have works and those who have faith and works are those who have love as part of that formation and so when james says that we are justified by works and not by faith alone what he means by faith alone there i would say is a faith that is void of works uh, a faith that is void of love there you are. <laughs> yes, miracle. And, and so basically, I, I would just I would just want to emphasize that faith and love go hand in hand. They cannot be separated. And if we try to separate them, we fall into the danger that St. James is trying to address. 
And the reason why that is wrong, I will answer by referring back to the last one hour. <laughs> <laughs> Jonah, thank you so much for coming on. It has, it has been a joy. I thought it was uh, very, uh, very exciting to, to talk with you. Um, I have always in, in loved the, uh, enjoyed the content you've provided, especially because we both speak, uh, at least in my um, understanding, from the western catholic position of, of christianity so so i feel yeah. a, a strong kinship especially with 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 a lot of anglicanism in, in that regard so so thank you so much for for what you do and and, and god bless you and yeah. uh, unless you have uh, anything else to say then i think uh, i'll just thank the listeners for following on yeah well thank you very much for having me on this was a it was a joy to talk and i i thoroughly enjoyed it Thank you. And remember, as always, may, may this work uh, to produce truth unto godliness for all of you. Thank you. 